Uh, my name is Neil Payton. I am a principal with the firm of Torty Gallus and Partners. Uh, my office is in Los Angeles, and I um, want to thank you all for coming out today. And um, if you haven't been here yet for this uh, weekend, I hope you'll be surprised and also pleasantly surprised at what you see. And if you've been coming day after day, thank you so much, because what you see here, we hope, represents the physical manifestation of the things you told us. So um, I want to introduce uh, my team members. Uh, first of all, my, my, one of my partners, Eric Alestia, who I, is right there. Eric is uh, in our office in Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, and we've been working together, I don't know, 20 years now, I think. Um, and uh, also part of our team is Martin Leitner, my colleague who works with me in Los Angeles. And uh, we were joined in this effort uh, by Mike Wilkins of Ver Verdunity, Ver Verdunity, who is locally based, and he helped us a lot with understanding the uh, water issues, drainage, uh, and stormwater issues that, uh, uh, that exist here and, and actually helped in understanding uh, one of the possible kind of ways to think about Race Street uh, to the west. And also really helping us tremendously was a uh, member of the Fort Worth planning staff, Katie Amelia, uh, who uh, contributed uh, much to this effort as well uh, in drawing, actual sitting at the, at the boards and drawing with us. So that was all important. And we had two people who you've never seen or met, but who actually contributed a lot to this. I'll just tell you their names. This, these drawings were done by a man named Chaiwat Pilanen um, from his home in San Diego. And uh, you'll see some images of some uh, models, three-dimensional models, and, and they were done by another one of my colleagues, Kelsey Liu, who's been sitting in our office by herself in Los Angeles this weekend. So, um, so it really was a kind of a larger team effort. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, so uh, just wanted to recap some things that sort of the way we think about approaching a project like this, and certainly what we think is operable here. Uh, when we looked at this, it, it would really had to do with knowing the history of this place. Uh, and certainly we don't know it as well as we would if we were here longer, but we, we got some. And certainly listening to you uh, provided us more. Uh, and of course, capital, once you know that history, capitalizing on, on the opportunities that you identify and that we find and, and trying to work with the constraints that, that inevitably present themselves. Uh, and from that, trying to create a vision that is compelling and long lasting, knowing that any of the details that you see here today is subject to change many, many times. But hopefully some of the larger vision uh, ideas will become uh, kind of legacy ideas that will enable this plan to achieve uh, completion. Uh, making complete streets, it's hard to imagine such a specific thing as warranting such a bullet point, but for us, kind of making complete streets, streets that are really wonderful to be on, uh, is a really important part of making this a place. And when we mean streets, we don't, we don't just mean the places where the cars drive. We actually mean the places that we inhabit as, as citizens. Cars drive there, we walk there, bicyclists go there, we do business there, we engage in community there. Mixing uh, the building types that will populate this area is an important part of it. Um, normally, I don't try to say anything that is remotely political, but apparently someone around here said many, many years ago, uh, that apartments were things that poor people lived in. And I, I find that amazingly dumb and I, as an idea uh, and, and really offensive. Um, you know, my kid will live in an apartment when he graduates college. Uh, my mother lives in an apartment. Actually, you know, neither one are poor uh, and they're not wealthy, but they're not poor and they choose to live there because and maybe they're more convenient, maybe it's appropriate for their age group. Uh, a lot of people live in a lot of different types of housing. Uh, not all of them are single family. And I know that as our children grow up, we sometimes want them to live near us, but you know, something that they can afford and something nice uh, nearby. And likewise, when we retire, maybe we wanna live nearby, 
but in something other than a single family house. So there are a lot of other people who want to live in a lot of different combinations and situations and communities, if we want to grow up and grow old in them, have to really be able to accommodate many different people. We all agree, that's good. Um, parking strategy, you know, it's funny, there is not a park, it's one of the few places I've ever been where there isn't the parking problem at the moment. But <laughs> if it is successful, there will be. So knowing that in advance, uh, starting out now with sort of developing a parking strategy will be an important part of this. And we're gonna to touch on this later in the presentation, but really, frankly, only touch on it because the problem is gonna be a little bit thicker than that. And then finally, an implementation plan. And we're gonna end the conversation today with what I think are some very quick short-term steps, things that could be done in the next six months, uh, and some medium-term steps, and also some policy steps. So, next. So again, going down to the history, just a very brief recap, not like I did the other night. Uh, you, you've all done a master plan for this area. I think it was adopted in 2007. This is one of the images from that uh, presentation. Next. Uh, and then this was the schedule that, was, that really led up to that implementation. So next. Uh, and this was some of the values and principles that were identified at the time. And one of the things I think that is interesting is I think the most of those values and principles are still uh, uh, operative today. I think maybe you've identified a few new ones um, that maybe are interesting, uh, which is good. Next. So just to give you a sense of where we are, um, here is um, the, uh, a view uh, uh, that just looks at the area from, from the sky. Uh, it's, it's at a scale that, let's just say it's 200 scale. What does that mean? You'll see a bigger version that'll say 100. That's, that's twice as big. So um, just, <laughs> let me just point out um, where we are now. The arrow is, is, is literally the, the building we're in right now and just point out Ray Street all along, so there you know, okay. Um, so that's where we are, next. And the other day, um, yeah, I think should we go back one with that, yeah, whoops, okay. The other day I pointed something out that, uh, if you weren't here, I wanna just re recap it. Um, one of the things that uh, we talk about when we talk about walkability uh, are, is having great sidewalks, uh, a, a lot of storefronts and, and active frontages to look at. And these are very important things to making a place walkable. One of the things that people don't always consider that actually is very important to walkability is how many ways there are to get to something. Uh, the kind of uh, uh, fineness of the grid of streets. And if you think about a city grid, a city set of streets like, uh, like a fabric, and we can think of coarse fabrics, coarsely woven fabrics, and finely woven fabrics. Cities that have finer, a finer weave to their fabric um, tend to also be more walkable. So with that in mind, we, we looked at uh, what is a, something called intersection density, which is literally how many intersections there are in a square mile in the area. And that's actually a pretty good measure of, of uh, walkability. Uh, one of the measures of walkability. And uh, we did that measure and found out that uh, in this area, in the square mile, there's uh, 150 intersections uh, per mile. And you should know that uh, organizations uh, like uh, USGBC, which is the United States Green Building Council, which sponsors things like uh, the LEED uh, Sustainability Rating Program, considers 150 about the minimum number of intersections for a walkable neighborhood. So you actually are at that level, just literally at that level. But one of the things we looked at was we, we noticed that it's not all the same. And so we highlighted just the area that we're, look, we're really working in now and uh, the area of the, of the actual six points kind of village area and counted those intersections and Keep going, no, yeah. okay, good. And, and actually 
we find that there are 268 intersections per square mile. In other words, 57 in this area, and this is one, one quarter of it. Um, so, or 67. Uh, so um, that's interesting because it, it really suggests, in case you didn't notice it, one of the reasons why this area in particular is even more walkable than its immediate area around there, and something that we want to continue to work on. Um, and so then when there are opportunities for even more places of connection, more intersections, we actually think that those are, the, are better. The more routes to any destination, the less any one route has to do. The more you can spread things out, the less any one of them has to work. Next. So that'll be something that informs some of the later images you see. So uh, again, here is the site at 200 scale. And the yellow outline is the boundary of the original Six Points Village Master Plan that you uh, completed in 2007 and the plan that came out of that. And importantly, what came out of that and, and really has been, de been developing since is an idea about uh, Ray Street and the streetscape of Ray Street of, let me say, putting it on something of a diet, which I know I can't always say, but I'm going to. Um, uh, and in this case, the diet is, uh, it's a very nuanced kind of diet because it has a number of different uh, elements in it. It has some diagonal parking. It has uh, separated uh, and protected bike lanes to it uh, and a new area for planting trees. And this plan um, is in the works. It's, you know, it's, I think, 30% drawn. Uh, I think there's funding for it. So that's a real uh, tangible outcome of the work that's been going on and I think will make a huge difference. Next. But now you've expanded the uh, boundaries of the village plan uh, to the west of Sylvania, all the way to Oakhurst Scenic Drive. And as you do that, um, you kind of have to reevaluate the whole uh, sort of idea of where this, this sort of heart of this village is, if it has more than one heart, let's say. And so the circles you see, uh, you saw one in it previously, Circle represents about a quarter of a mile um, radius circle, uh, or a half mile uh, in diameter circle. And the first one was sort of centered in the middle of Ray Street, but now that we've got uh, the, the area extended, you see I, we've drawn two circles, suggesting that there might be kind of more than one center, uh, more than one area of, of really uh, coming together as a community. Not that you can't come together anywhere, but, but that these might be really seen as the kind of focuses or foci of the, of the community. So um, that's sort of where that, what that means. Next. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of some of the things we talked about on, um, on Thursday night when we started and um, when, when we got here. And many of you were here for that. A few of you uh, maybe have just joined us today for the first time. But uh, those of you who were here then, we, you know, we broke up into, into tables all around this room and we identified some of the ideas that we've been thinking about, you've been thinking about, uh, and you uh, brought them up to us. Uh, and we drew and we wrote. And this is just a sampling of what I could fit on one slide. Um, but some of the things that you see here are things like, um, you know, places for people to sit, um, sort of a lot of idea about, uh, water, um, playgrounds, recreational activities. Uh, you want it uh, to be uh, an arts, you know, really reinforce the idea of an arts district. Um, uh, connecting to the Riverside Park. Um, so, uh, you know, these were things that we saw uh, over and over in each of the groups, similar ideas came about. Uh, one of the groups actually the one I was at, perhaps more than one, suggested closing a piece of, little piece of race street in front of this building, um, which uh, we, we thought about for a while too. So there were a lot of other ideas, uh, and many of those I think you will see. Next. So as, as that was going on, or immediately thereafter, uh, we started doing some diagrams. Eric, uh, in particular, and my team, was, was uh, sort of trying to think about things like front doors you know, which is sort of funny to think about in the city, uh, but if 
you know, you sort of think about a city as a house. Um, in this case, you know, you could get into the house from a number of ways. And what would it mean to get in from these different places, right? What were the key connectors? Uh, and how did, you, how did you arrive from there? Next. Uh, and then uh, he, uh, he expanded that thought to uh, a thought about focusing on these key places, some of which are, were identified in that map you just saw, and then some new ones that he identified. And these were places that both were intersections of streets and that might provide the opportunity for something more than just two places, or places for two cars to meet each other, but maybe places for humans to meet each other. Uh, and they might have artwork associated with them, you know, significant artwork, or there might be some park associated with them, uh, or the like. And so, really, it was to sort of think about almost strategically, or I should say tactically, key places in the area that might be worked on. So rather than think about it just as this kind of grand gesture, we were actually looking at it also the opposite way, little gestures that could be, could be like uh, stones in a pond that would create ripples. Sort of a both and strategy. Next. So from that idea, uh, we all sat down. Actually, I didn't. I, I didn't draw these, but uh, Martin and Katie and Eric were drawing plans um, of various types, each, each of them doing what they thought they heard from the community. Um, and um, so here's one. Uh, and you'll see they're very similar, but you'll see differences uh, along um, maybe at the intersection of race and Sylvania, or at the intersection of race with uh, Riverside, with, at the Six Points, or even some of the sort of inner, inner in, inside areas. Next. So here's another. You can see in this one, race sort of curves to meet um, Sylvania. There's another coming up. Uh, and here you see, um, again, uh, you know, key moments uh, at um, at the triangle, at uh, race in Riverside, at the at the uh, section at, where race meets Sylvania, and then the kind of uh, super graphic wild place there, uh, <laughs> which was very fun. Um, so, okay, a lot of different sort of big ideas. Uh, ne next. And then we also were looking at these very key places that had been identified as problematic. And the one that obviously was the most on everybody's mind was race in Sylvania. And we had heard uh, that there was a, an idea about putting in a, a roundabout there as a way of solving that problem. And I think we're all, I think none of us are opposed to roundabouts or uh, at all, but but, but only if they're used in the right place. And we came to the conclusion that a roundabout might not be the best thing in this place. I, I, don't, know. She, I don't think she th thinks so either. Uh, and the reason is, while roundabouts are very, very good at, at calming traffic around an intersection and really present a really nice alternative to traffic lights, um, they don't always make it easier for pedestrians to cross. It's not to say that a pedestrian can't cross it. It's just not necessarily as easy as, say, a typical striped intersection is, uh, which is a bit more urbane, more, I think, appropriate to, to this key spot. And so we wanted to look at if there were other alternatives that maybe were cost less costly. And the first one that came to mind once we actually walked the intersection, and, and there's Martin dodging the cars, and, and, and you'd think they were moving, and he was somehow taking his life in his hands, but here he is crossing. He says that there was a flashing hand. You can't tell that, but that it, was, it, it wasn't. He, had, he started when it was still okay. Um, so he's crossing legally, but of course there's no crosswalk there, and there's no, the, there's no, the stop for the cars is in the way. So of course this is not good. But one solution is to repaint it. 
And uh, Martin tells me that the cost of doing these, what they call zebra stripes, for a full intersection uh, is $10,000. Uh, this was, they just did them all in LA recently, and I don't know, it's probably cheaper, it's probably 9,500 here. So, <laughs> so um, I don't know. I, it, seems to, it seemed to us that for around $10,000, if you could solve a good chunk of that problem. You've got the light already, so it's not like you're asking for a new light. Uh, and it's not that, you know, there aren't other things you could do to make it even better, and believe me, you'll see some, but where you have, a, let's say, a finite amount of money, you know, you want to be making sure that you're spending it as shrewdly as you can. And if you can solve part of the problem, at least temporarily, with that amount of money, that saves, gives you money for something else. So one idea is to just repaint it effectively um, with the stripes and the crosswalks in the right place. Next. Of course, there are many other things you could do that would be more, interest, more costly, but, but potentially very interesting. So for example, uh, in, in this case, what you see is an example where the actual uh, location of race coming from the west is brought through, which means you actually take a piece of land in the front uh, on this property in order to bring the intersection through, but you then, in a sense, give over a piece, that, a piece, an equal piece of land to the side of what is now the shopping center so a new building can be placed along that side and kind of uh, front this new piece of, of race, where the intersection is still signaled, but then a kind of elaborate um, paving or painting strategy really makes a place out of that. Here's the same idea again, without the elaborate place here, but brought up a little bit further, where the race has to rejoin again. Now we create a small plaza out of that. Same, but the same basic idea of moving Ray Street a block or, or moving it down some for one block. Another idea is to simply bend race to meet uh, Sylvania. Again, requires a little bit of property to, in order to make that work. But even with the, the roundabout requires a little bit of that property too. And then a small space is created as a result, which could be a, you know, a small shop or a, uh, a covered uh, market of some sort or whatever. And then maybe some additional, since that's going to be taken, maybe as this land develops, additional land becomes provided for a small park or, or plaza here with a shade structure and a pavilion of some sort so that as you come through, you see that and you're diverted up. Same idea as, as that. But now leaving Ray Street and w exactly where it is, uh, you know, using the paint scheme, but also still creating a plaza and a uh, pavilion and whatever there, so that you're creating a place out of this out of this intersection. Uh, and the fact that these two streets are not aligned, you're actually making an asset out of that because your your eye is visually terminates and and. and you know, brought to those places. Uh, so I'm sure there are many others, but those were some. Next. Likewise, the idea of closing um, race at, uh, at Riverside uh, at the Six Points, we, we heard that this is a, a rather difficult intersection, and having crossed it myself uh, four or five times, uh, it's really amazingly horrible, um, <laughs> is the best I can say. Um, so, you know, maybe there's just the Six Points is a nice name for a place, but might not be good for an intersection. So, uh, what if we closed one of the streets? So, you know, the first idea was to close race for this one block. And then because uh, we we're here and we were going to be leaving in two days, and if this was a stupid idea, we wouldn't have to really deal with it, we thought, um, let's try closing Belknap for one block and see what that would do. Um, and so the idea here was 
that you come up through Belknap and you kind of route around it and keep going, or you're coming down Belknap and route around it and keep going, so that you create the sort of almost, not quite the courthouse square here, but a square. Um, so, uh, one of the images sort of just left, but whatever. Uh, oh, there, okay, there. So then there one more, which was really based on this one, uh, in which we, we took that idea, but then um, uh, took this street, whose name I can't remember, and then bent it so it met Belknap uh, on a perp at perpendicular, like that. And ultimately, that's the one that you will see um, represented in the plan, that one. All right, next. And you put that back in, because it, is it there? Is it? It just, okay, good. So you see, there it is again, and we wanted to show you that you could do this, you could do part of this fairly quickly. This is an example of something very similar in Los Angeles that was done called Sunset Triangle Plaza. It was done for a space kind of pretty much like this one. It was done with paint. They literally painted here. You can see the, the workmen uh, painting it with this template that they had, right? They used simply concrete planters to block the street. They did this in what, two days? The total cost, $25,000, which in the scheme of things is pretty small, right? Um, and it was about the same size as this area. Wildly successful. They have street fairs and plazas and people come with their kids and the like. So now they've actually uh, made it permanent and they've done more to it. And it's more expensive, but only because they did the test, but they, because they were able to try it out for a couple years. And what happened was the paint started to wear out, but the paint is not the best material to do this with because it does wear off, but um, it worked for two years. And um, it, let them, it let the city see that this could work. And so one idea is, you know, you can leave this street as it is, not do anything to that for a while, and just try literally blocking the street and painting it and seeing if it works. And if it does, great. And if it doesn't, the paint will wear off and, you take the, um, and you're no worse for the wear. So next. So with all of that said, here is the plan that uh, you maybe looked at on the table. And we're going to take you through some of the highlights. Uh, but this is what we call the recommended plan. We, we, it combines these various issues and things we've been talking about. Uh, it recognizes that um, you know, several large parcels of land are being looked at for development possibility. It also recognizes that um, some of the things you see drawn here are drawn on sites that actually have buildings on them now. Um, and the reason we do that is because I will tell you that things change every day. Somebody wants to sell a piece of property tomorrow, but they didn't today. And so all of a sudden, in a sense, what you would draw would be different. So we try not to be obsessive about this individual thing or that individual thing, because it's really impossible to say, but rather start to show ideas that may only partially be doable. They, they could be incremental. And this is why I say, will, will this block ultimately develop exactly like this? Probably not. But is that a representation of a way to think about that block or another block? Yes. So maybe fragments of it do. And that's really what you're looking to do. So hopefully, just to give you a sense of where you are, you can see this is Ray Street. This is Sylvania. This is Oakhurst Scenic Drive. This is Race going down to that point. This is, this is Belknap, right? So um, next. Should, yeah, okay. So here you see where the, the, the race street improvement are, uh, improvements, uh, which don't seem to be spelled right, um, but uh, are, um, 
already in place, or not in place, but they're already being designed. And that's sort of going ahead. So next, OK. So then what you see here are new proposed street connections. So um, some of these are very minor, and some of these are more significant. For example, here you see um, this yellow. This, this street exists, but this represents a kind of new route north-south from um, Belknap to Race. That's sort of halfway between uh, Oakhurst Scenic Drive and Sylvania. Would that exact location be the location? <laughs> Impossible to know. The idea here is that as these new developments start to come online, that we really try to get those streets done. Uh, and it might be only one block for one development, and maybe eventually it becomes two. Why is that important? Well, remember that issue of, inter of street uh, intersection density? Well, one of the things that happens is, you know, as more development occurs here, um, you know, as it wants to go north-south, it goes onto Oakhurst Scenic Drive or onto Sylvania. And uh, it would be great if there was a third way, because it means those other two streets really don't get overcrowded. Uh, again, the, those blocks are actually quite long, and so this is a, just an alternative. And again, we think that cities work best when there are more, when there is more connectivity, not less. More connectivity is almost always better. So uh, it's something that uh, really should be uh, looked at very carefully as each project uh, comes online. And frankly, ought to be part of any kind of form-based code that ultimately gets uh, produced here. The other streets, you can see this one is simply the rerouting of um, Chandler that we just talked about, just to uh, make it perpendicular with uh, Belknap, because one of the things I think that'll happen is you'll see that right now there's a bus stop here that we've just cut out. Um, so, you know, that has to obviously be rerouted. and. You know, buses, I'm sure, like to make right turns rather than really, like, you know, hard right. So, you know, that's one thing. But, and then you see another, the Plumwood Street is sort of extended also. And again, with an idea that, you know, another connection out would, would be ideal. So uh, that's what that is. And then we have one, we have a couple of pedestrian connections. These are not new streets, but they do represent new ways of going through. So one of these is uh, right here. Uh, and um, I know that that's where um, there's been a large assemblage. It's where the arts uh, sort of facilities are now. And you know, some conversation about new development there, which is great. Uh, we would encourage that any new development at least allow a pedestrian connection through it. Uh, and that might include be part of a courtyard space that's part of a building but that the, but the public is allowed to go through and continue through all the way to Belknap. Again, it's another way to move around. Each one of those adds richness and adds um, a kind of walkability to it all. Next. And then, um, uh, okay. I think this next one is street improvements. So these are streets that are already here. Uh, one of them is Belknap and one of them is Sylvania, uh, and that these are places where we've heard that, well, particularly Sylvania, this idea of creating a more pedestrian-friendly street there. Several of you talked about a road diet. It wasn't my, even me bringing it up. Several of you used that term for Sylvania, uh, and Belknap uh, sort of, I think people, everybody recognizes that it's very wide for the amount of traffic it carries, so sort of that became obvious as well. Next. And then the idea of these sort of moments or significant crosswalks that were part of that. So, uh, you know, really, as something as simple as a crosswalk can be is so important. Uh, and sort of the, uh, some of the opportunities that exist for improving the crosswalks, obviously the one we've talked about, but really a, a number of others as well. Next. So, and again, uh, talking about th those street improvements and crosswalks, the reason we want to do them is, is, is for the pedestrian. 
not for the automobile, which is, I think, very well accommodated here. Um, but the, um, the, the, the pedestrian improvements could include wider sidewalks or sidewalks that have some kind of articulation. Uh, you all talked about greenery, about shade, about places to sit, about art, public art. But importantly as well, the idea of buildings that support that space through frontages that are kind of active, through buildings that have human scale and the like. And the latter, although the city itself does not produce those buildings, the city can be an, an instigator through its policies, uh, its, its codes and zoning that really reinforce the importance of urban form. Um, so that's important. Next. So as part of that, um, this is, uh, Katie, Katie was kind enough to spend all day yesterday um, detailing street section improvements. And um, so here is an idea for Belknap uh, uh, for most of the way. Uh, what, what we see here is, is actually no real change to the curb line. This is, this is paint that we need here. That's all we're talking about is paint. We're not actually changing where the curb is. We're simply converting um, the, uh, the, the lanes, uh, two of the lanes, essentially to parking lanes. Uh, we're taking a four-lane road uh, now and making it into a three-lane road with two parking lanes and narrowing the, the lanes that already uh, are there. Uh, and that way, um, uh, you get parking, which uh, and will serve you know businesses and the like that, that could start to locate along Belknap. Next, uh, at the Triangle uh, at, at Arts Plaza, as as we've called it, same real idea, same section. Uh, we simply have a park on one side, but the same basic. Um, in this case, however, Belknap is wider. It's the one place there that it's, it's about 10 feet wider. So here you would pick up about 10 feet of an amenity zone on the park side. You don't have to do that right away. If you, there's no money, you do it later. But, you know, but the rest is just paint. Next. Here we are at Sylvania, and again, paint. Not changing any curbs. I mean, there are things you could do that were more expensive than this. But this is something, again, you could do fairly quickly. Uh, and again, this is now using 11-foot uh, travel lanes and 11-foot turn lane, again, taking the four lanes of traffic and turning it into three. Um, and let me just give you, tell you something that in general, three lanes are just as efficient as four lanes. Because, this, in the, because with a four-lane road, the left turning and movements effectively stop traffic anyway. So um, this provides uh, a, one, a parking, a bike lane on one side of five feet, on the other side, uh, an eight foot uh, row of, of a parking lane and a four foot bike lane. Now we noticed that on the um, Fort Worth uh, bike, bicycle master plan, what's that, five feet. I know, I know you like five feet, but I don't have, a, I don't have another foot. <laughs> so I, I don't know what to say, we could make those we could make the travel lanes 10 and a half feet. That, that's one way to do it. Uh, the traffic people are gonna get a little bit um, apoplectic about that, but they're not gonna love 11 feet. But, um, but you could do it. Actually, you only really truly need 10 feet for a street like that. But, so that's another possibility. Um, we just thought, so we didn't blow anybody's head away, that 11 feet would be a compromise, and we'd love it if you could do 10 and give a bigger bike lane. Or you could not have the parking at all, but we thought it'd be really nice to have at least one row of parking there. So that's the, that's the possibility there. But regardless of which it is, you, this is all done right now within the, the existing curb lines. So it just requires paint. I know paint isn't free, but it's a lot cheaper than moving curbs. Um, next. So there you have all that. And then we have a set of open spaces that we identified. And those open spaces um, come out of the, the Race Street, Sylvania disjuncture, making one there. And then maybe making one in front of 
uh, where that big tree is and is a, basically an empty lot, what's the name of the taco place that sides up to it? Fuzzies. So Fuzzies is there. And what, what this shows is actually a new building here. So it's not like we're just, there's no use of the land. There, there's a new building there set back behind that gigantic tree. Uh, and then the rest being turned into a splash park uh, for kids and, and then a kind of artistically done kind of plaza into the street. Uh, and then this is Arts Plaza down, down here. We've talked about that, I think, already. Um, down at the other end of Ray Street, one of the ideas that uh, really came out of, of the conversation uh, with, with Mike Wilkins of, of Verdunity and Eric and Alessia and our, and our group is the idea of allowing water, uh, some of the stormwater, to, in a sense, be to come down race as it starts going down the hill and celebrate that, the water, into some sort of a garden that could be result from a, a setback of, of the development here, you know, of, of what, 30, 40 feet, 50, you think, or so, or 50 feet, uh, that could be planted with beautiful ornamental trees, and the water itself is, you know, it's got rocks, and it, it bubbles, and it dr drops, and it does nice things like that, and then it ends in a little, a little bit of a pond here, and all of that is actually helping to uh, clean the water, filter the water before it enters the Trinity River, and is also providing a way, a, a kind of an amenity as you move down Ray Street, and makes it a bit different than the Ray Street east of Sylvania. Gives it another character and says, hey, you're not in the urban center now, now you're moving toward the, toward the river itself. So the treatment ought to be a little bit different. And, and in fact, in this suggestion, there's a, tree, a little bit of a small amount of center tree planting at Race at the intersection just to signal that idea. And then, uh, because of the topography there, the opportunity for really creating other really great sequences to uh, Oakhurst Scenic Drive and the park, in this case another one here that the private sector would hopefully would do as they developed here that might have a stair sequence that was beautifully landscaped and provided another sort of, excuse me, fabulous vista and sequence to the park. To the park. Likewise, as you as you come, uh, descend race uh, and you arrive at the park, the idea of making a kind of special place within the linear park that it's not just one continuous sort of swath, but this is almost, you know, you, know, you have playing fields and you have something here kind of carved out with uh, flowering gardens and sculpture and maybe a little picnic area that could be here as well, and, and really create a, a kind of special park within a park uh, at that spot. Uh, other smaller spaces, uh, again, Plumwood is extended, but it, it, it becomes uh, acres, and there's a kind of another one of these junk disjunctures in the grid, and so possibly making a small little kind of uh, space out of that disjuncture there that might serve the new development in the middle of this area, and even where these streets kind of come to uh, Belknap, maybe other small squares, small spaces that could, that could exist. Um, and then the making of the roundabouts here. Again, we weren't so crazy about a roundabout here, but down at Belknap in Sylvania, that's a whole different story because that really is a place that you want to signal, create a gateway, really signal the prominence of the of the place, and then we wondered, well, does the gateway belong here, or does it belong at where Belknap really crosses the river in completely and meets Oakhurst Scenic Drive? And then we said, well, maybe at both, <laughs> because we couldn't decide. But no, also because actually they, they travel in pairs, um, roundabouts do. So um, they, they actually work well together. So that's another possibility. Um, so those are kind of highlighting some of the civic or open spaces that we think could be introduced as part of the plan that would not only provide places to gather and sit and, and, and have uh, coffee, uh, but there's only so much coffee you can drink. So, you know, other things, art, um, work, uh, and, and, and arts, uh, entertainment, and the like. Next. So here's that arts plaza uh, that we looked at earlier. Here it is again, and 
This is just one idea. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, what you're looking at here is this is, well, this is the, the church building. We're actually right here in this part of the building. I was surprised to learn today that actually what looks like the older building is the newer building. That's uh, amazing. Uh, anyway, um, but there that is. Uh, the, the, the folks who are kind of creating this uh, uh, arts, the Travis Art Academy of Fine Art, expressed a desire for a kind of loggia or a kind of screen to complete the quadrangle to make it almost like a cloister. So that's what you see here with some art in the closed street and some folks, I don't know if you can do that on grass or not, but, um, uh, but maybe you can. Um, and, and then a, a cafe and a shade structure because I know it gets very hot here. And um, so there's an idea. Uh, next. So then uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the building types. And this sort of goes back to this idea that different people want and need different things during their lives. Uh, so one is, is sort of the apartment building that wraps around a structured parking garage. You see one example there uh, in, uh, outlined in red. You know, that's, that's probably the highest budget item uh, from all of the building types here. Um, the garages don't come cheap. Uh, and it's not the first thing that's going to get done. Just because the, the, right now the, the rents in this area don't really support that. But it will one day. I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident of that. And so I think you really have to plan for that. So there's one idea of that. Interestingly enough, that particular site, if you were to produce a plaza or some sort like this, this building, particularly here, becomes quite prominent. This building that's one block in actually gets a new level of prominence from Sylvania. Next. Another type would be some sort of a townhouse uh, that you see here. Uh, these townhouses can be quite luxurious. They, just because they're row houses doesn't mean they have to be, you know, less good. Um, it just means you don't have grass or open space on the side of your house. Uh, they can be quite elegant uh, and um, really very beautiful places. And so you see that illustrated as well. Next. And here's another one. These, this is, these are apartments, but they have surface parking sort of behind them. And, and in this case, this is an earlier form of development probably because the parking is considerably cheaper to build because it's on the ground. Uh, but obviously, you don't get as many of the apartments. But it certainly is something that you can make a nice town out of. Other things you see here is you see a grocery store with its parking and even a, a little pavilion in front of the grocery store to help make the circle uh, and the like. Next. And so that's really it from a kind of um, um, presentation of, of some of the proposals. I'm going to briefly talk about some of uh, the recommendations for implementation. But I just wanted to show you a, a little bit of a view of the uh, Oakhurst Scenic Drive. Um, I have to apologize. This is probably, what's that? Well, all of us were busy at the end here. <laughs> this was probably done at um, 2.25. So, um, but uh, it's really drive. Um, and, um, you know, uh, just this idea that you can have an edge, you can have a kind of variety to that edge. Uh, you know, it's got this great bluff of trees that you'd retain. Uh, and really could help animate, overlook the park, really help keep the park safe, because eyes on the park are an important, like eyes on the street, eyes on the park. Having people have windows and seeing out onto the park means that there's a kind of natural oversight of the activity that goes on there. And it's really one of the things that helps keep it safe, uh, for, uh, a safe place to be. Uh, and it's one of the things that helps provide, in this case, the density here helps to provide people to go to the coffee shops and buy the stuff that would help animate Race Street. Next. Oh, right. I wanted to show you some pictures of the model we did. So here's the, here's a, this is just an overhead of, of the model. And next. And here it is sort of built out. 
And now we're going to see some other views of that. So next, here we are looking from the east to the west down race. Next. And here we see that as well. And then next, here we are sort of above Oakhurst Scenic Drive looking to the south. And next, and how that might be built out. And one more. And this is, again, above Oakhurst Scenic Drive, looking kind of east. Next. Right. And you see the water coming down. And you see the kind of terraced park uh, and, and the like. So just um, gives you a sense of the three-dimensionality of it. Next. So some of the recommendations that we have for the near term, um, and again, these are things that you know, we think could be done relatively quickly. And I would say certainly within a year and possibly in some cases within six months. Uh, certainly fixing the intersection of race at Sylvania with new striping and decorative painting if you have the, the money. I mean, a little bit of a template and like we showed before you know, making something festive out of it. It's a signal, so it's, it's more than just we can cross the street safely now. It's actually saying, hey, there's something here. You know, maybe take a look. Um, test the closing of Race Street in a way that we illustrated. So it's not permanent, but allows you to see how it works. When you, if you do that, you're gonna have to also think about how you can animate it. Like, since the school isn't here yet, um, you know, you'll, you might want to think about other things that can go on there or events that can be, can be done. Otherwise, it'll sit there sort of lonely. Uh, the restriping of Sylvania, uh, again, something that, you know, it, it's not, I mean, certainly has to be thought about. And is it 11 foot travel lanes? Is it 10 and a half? Is it 10? I mean, these are things that people have to spend a few months arguing over first. But eventually, you'll do that and, and make, and you can make that. The last one, you know, probably a little bit more complicated because it's not, it's not your road, it's TxDOT's road. But certainly it seems like worth the conversation to have it now. And one thought we had was test it just in front of the triangle. Test it for one block or two blocks. You know, let them sort of see how that is and work with them to see if that can be tested and if that's worth doing. So again, this is mostly a, a, um, a scheme that relies on paint. Um, the one other thing that didn't get listed here because it was an afterthought uh, on, on our part was maybe a little bit of signage down um, near uh, the highway that says, hey, you know, Six Points Village, go right. Uh, you'd be surprised at what that can do. So a couple of signs there might help be helpful. Next. So this is more midterm. Uh, these things cost more money. Uh, so. This would be permanently closing race for one block, as we just described, uh, and possibly you know, acquiring the triangle of land uh, and ultimately re-aiming the, the street uh, to create the arts park. Uh, again, um, uh, number two, acquiring land if necessary to permanently improve the race street intersection. This is in doing one of the other sort of suggestions we showed you know, a plaza of some sort or a park or whatever, moving the street, any one of those would require acquisition of land and, in a sense, some rebuilding. So that's a little bit more of a midterm thing. Uh, obviously, extending Ray Street streetscape west of, west of Sylvania to Oakhurst. Um, if there's development there, then that should be part of the development that occurs as it, as it occurs. Um, new tree planting and streetscaping along Sylvania. Because restriping would be nice, but a little bit more emphasis there on the streetscape would be even better. Uh, so that would be important. And then ultimately, acquiring Belknap from TxDOT and creating the roundabouts that we talked about, as well as new streetscape and tree planting. Next. And then these are some policy recommendations. I haven't talked about this at all yet today, but there are a number of very mature trees in the downtown area. Um, and, you know, they really help give a character that you cannot buy. 
And so, you know, they should be identified and a uh, policy for developers who are working around them, to, to work around them uh, and not, not penalize the developer for saving them. So somehow there's, there's some way to recoup the land, if you will, in some way, but, but to at least encourage that savings. I, I actually think it would, it'll help the value of the development itself and also the neighborhood as a whole. Um, creating a parking district to provide a park one's strategy. So what does that mean? So in a lot of cities, in fact, most cities, when you, when you, have, a, when you have a business, you have to have a certain amount of parking spaces for that business. And if your neighbor has a business, they have a certain amount of parking spaces for that business. And if you have a restaurant, you have a certain amount of parking spaces. And everybody has this required amount of parking spaces. And of course, the spaces stay empty some of the time at some, each of these businesses, and usually at different times. If you have a restaurant, it's got a different set of busy times than other places. If you have a church, they're busy at certain times and not others. So you have all this parking that's built, and some of it's being used some of the time, and some of it is being used other times. And if you're doing business in more than one place, theoretically, you're only allowed to park in this parking lot if you're doing business with that eight person. So if you want to go two blocks away, you have to move your car. So what cities have done now is develop something called a park once strategy, in which the idea is you come, you park your car, and then you do all your things in the same area in that area from one parking space. For, for you to do that, there has to be a pool of parking that's available to you that isn't just for one business. So one way to do that is to build parking if the city owns land or provide parking lots, and that's, that's fine. But if the city doesn't happen to own any of that land, uh, another way to do it is to create an incentive for individual business owners and owners of property to pool their parking into a shared, as a shared resource, uh, so that, uh, you know, their parking, uh, if, they, if you have a new business and you can't quite meet your parking requirements, you can pay into a, a fund, so in lieu of, instead of having to meet your parking on the premises, you can either make a contract with a neighbor who has parking or you simply pay a fund, pay into a fund. And the advantage there is you build less parking overall, you make things more affordable. And here's what I've seen happen, which is where the real payoff is. Well, you reduce traffic demand quite a bit. But we've seen so many cases of a small business that actually is successful and can't expand because they don't have enough land to put the required amount of parking on the um, site. And that's really a tragedy when you see that, especially when you see the next door neighbor with an empty parking lot. And so this is a way to deal with that. Setting up a parking district or a parking authority takes a lot of work. It's a lot of brain damage. It's kind of complicated. But by doing it now, by starting to think about it now, before the demand is great, you will be way ahead of the curve. There are, there are large pieces of land behind some of these buildings that are on the north side of the street. They're owned by individuals, to be sure. But they, they do represent a pool of parking that could be leveraged with the right incentives. So we really encourage that. Develop um, a policy to ensure uh, this incremental creation of this new north-south street that we spoke of between uh, Belknap and um, uh, Race. Uh, and this is just really gonna be through a form-based code, mostly, I think, uh, to make that happen. And then obviously related to that is the, a form-based code of some sort. When I say a form-based code, what I mean is Zoning that not only speaks to how much you can build and what you can do in the building, but just as importantly speaks to the form of the building to the extent that it affects the pedestrian on the street. Buildings will impact how we perceive the space. They can impact it positively or negatively, and so we want it to be positively. So many places, including this place, have introduced form-based codes for various neighborhoods in order to assure that, and that's really what we're talking about here. So with that, next, I think that's the end of what we did on our summer vacation. <laughs>